Good morning. It's good to be with you again as we gather to study a portion of the Lord's Holy Word. And we will continue our study this morning in Malachi chapter 2, beginning in uh, the first of the chapter, uh, going down through about verse 9. Uh, but before we start that, would you bow with me as we offer a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give us each day. And especially this morning that we can gather ourselves together wherever we're at and stop and study a portion of your word in peace. We ask you to continue to bless our gatherings that we ask you to continue the blessings that you have given us, the blessings of freedom and of health and of safety. We pray, dear Lord, that you will continue these upon us as we walk in your word each day. We ask you to be with all those who are suffering this morning, especially those who are suffering with the coronavirus. We pray, dear Lord, that you will comfort them that you will restore the health that they desire, be with the medical personnel who are treating them, that they may be able to restore the health that they desire. And we pray that you will keep those medical personnel safe also. Keep them healthy as they work under just a terrible conditions. We pray, dear Lord, that you will allow us this morning to open a portion of your word and study it, that we will be able to apply it to our lives as we ask all of these things through your son Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> and as we begin our class this morning, we are, uh, as I said, going to be starting in Malachi chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1. And if you'll follow along as I read it this morning. And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feasts. And one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me, so he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. And as we go back and we look at this, we know that God is now focusing his admonition and his uh, disdain for the worship service on uh, the priest. Now, we remember from last week, he was actually talking about that disdain and how that the individual Israelites had done wrong in their worship, in their sacrificing of animals. And in fact, in the way they lived each day, well, now he's focusing it on the priest 
and he actually tells the priest, I have a new commandment for you. Well, it's not a new commandment like we would understand that uh, in uh, the same fashion as Moses had brought down those Ten Commandments. It is just an admonition, an instruction, but it carries a heavier weight because they are the ones who are leading that worship to God. And it says, if you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart. Well, we know that was their problem. They hadn't really listen to the Lord in the fashion that they should have. They hadn't taken it to heart. Let's take a look over at Ezekiel chapter 3, and we're going to uh, be uh, look at verse 27. Ezekiel 3, uh, verse 27. And here, Ezekiel uh writes, but when I speak with you, I will open your mouth and you shall say to them, thus saith the Lord, he who hears, let him hear, and he who refuses, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. Let them do what they're going to do. Let them continue. He said, they're not listening to me anyway, and that's what Malachi uh, was recording as that admonition from God. He was saying in Malachi, if you uh, do not hear, if you do not take it to heart, God will judge you. And what Ezekiel was saying, they're going to do what they're going to do. If they're going to hear, they'll hear. If they're going to refuse the word, they're going to refuse the word. That's all there is to it. It isn't that God is going to force them to do and believe and act the way God wants them to do. He is going to allow them to live the lives of choice as we have today. And he encourages them and desires that they act according to his commandments. Let's also... Uh, for a moment, take a look uh, in Revelations. I'm sorry, Revelation. I'm continuing to correct myself on that. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 11. And here, as John records for us, he says in Revelation 22, 11, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. As John is writing this, he's saying that he's talking about that time is near, that judgment is near, and people are going to continue to do what they have done before. And that is the same thing that Malachi is saying here, even though the Lord is entreating them to do the will of God. They are going to continue to do what they want to do. And the Lord says, because of that, I will send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. You don't pay attention. What has God told us? So let's take a look at Matthew. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 37. Matthew 13, beginning in 37. And we're going to go down through 43. And here Jesus is answering and said to them, he says, he who sows a seed is the son of man. Now we remember, now Jesus is giving them 
an explanation of the parable of the tares, uh, that parable where he talks about the heads of grain and how there is grain and tares. And he says, and he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and that's sowing uh, those tares in the harvest. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the son of the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And we're going to, as we go through this, we're going to continue to see that admonition, he who has ears, let him hear. Now, it's not that they are speaking to people who are hard of hearing or deaf. They have turned off their hearing. They have turned off their listening. God is going to continue to admonish them and remind them they don't want to hear it. So he is going to send that curse upon him. And as we take a look in verse 3, where he says, uh, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feast. Now, this refuse is a much richer word than that. He's talking about those things that were part of the sacrifice but were uh, undesirable. They were the things as, as they were sacrificing their animals, uh, they took the inner parts which were unacceptable to sacrifice and they took them outside the camp and they would burn them outside the camp because they were not... Uh, they were detestable in the eyes of the Lord. They couldn't be offered on that altar. So here when he says, I'm going to spread refuse on your faces, it's, it's much richer than that when he talks about it. It is quite an insult that they are going to have to have that, uh, that those inner organs, those uh, things that are going to be uh cast on them uh, because they didn't listen to the rebuke of the Lord. And in fact, it says, and one will take you away with it. That is that uh, they are going to take you outside the camp. They are going to take you out to that dung heap, that spot where they burn those unacceptable uh, portions of the sacrifice. So as God is telling them that, that is what is going to happen. As we look at verse 3, here Malachi says, Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces. Now, when he says rebuke, this isn't um, as severe a blessing, I mean a, a severe a curse, as he actually put on the priests, it is something less. And why is that? It's because they are continuing on to follow those same practices uh, that their ancestors had. Their ancestors did not uh, follow God properly and are being cursed because of it. And that's also going to bring a rebuke on those descendants uh, of Aaron and Levi 
and all of those priests who followed on. And as we remember this, um, let's take a look at uh, Numbers 25, uh, verses 10 through uh, 13. Numbers 25, verses 10 through 13. And here we have recorded for us, um, leading up to this, there was such uh, a time for the Israelites that they intermarried with the Moabites. And the Moabites were the ones uh, who had served Baal, the, uh, the uh, forbidden god, uh, and they got caught up in the fact that they were also to please their wives participating in the worship of Baal and another god, and that was detestable. And God pronounced a decree to cleanse the Israelites of those practices. And essentially it was to kill all those who had turned their lives over to worshiping this foreign god. Uh, and it was like they had given up their allegiance in serving Jehovah God and had pledged their allegiance to Baal God. And that's the reason God had put such a terrible uh, condemnation on them. Uh, and it talks about here Phineas, who was a priest who purged the Israelite people. So now you have a little background to where we're at uh, in Numbers 25, beginning in verse 10. And here it says, And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore, say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an un everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. This was that covenant of peace that Malachi was also referring to uh, when we look uh, to where uh, in verse 4, then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And when he says Levi, he is talking about that priestly tribe, that tribe of Levi, that descendants that were serving in the temple. And there was a covenant that we just looked at um, where God had made that covenant in num uh, Numbers 25 with the priesthood because of Phineas and the way he had served with zeal in purging uh, those who had uh, sworn their lives to uh, the Moabite God. So as we see that, there was this covenant that God had made with the priesthood. And as God was doing that, he is going to bring their glory to disgrace. He is going to bring this curse upon them, bring their glory into disgrace. And what is the glory of the Jews. What is the glory of the Israelites? It was that covenant relationship with God. God had made a covenant with the nation and then a covenant with Levi because
because of uh, the way his descendants had responded to keep their worship pure. And that was the glory that they had. But God was going to turn that to disgrace because he was going to take that away from them because of how they had reacted, how they had given up that worship. They played a key role in that worship. And even though, as we looked at last week, those people, those men who were offering the sacrifices, offered sacrifices that were not up to the standard. They were imperfect sacrifices and should not have been offered. The priesthood went ahead and offered them. And that's why now their covenant relationship was uh, being destroyed by the way that they were ignoring those things that God had commanded them. He was telling them as they were uh, doing this, as we see uh, in the end of verse 5, and I gave them to him that he might fear me, so he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, continuing to speak of Phineas and how he had uh, protected uh, the worship uh, of the uh, Israelites. And injustice was not found in his lips. And he walked with me in peace and equity and turned away many from their iniquity. He had been faithful to me. And he's telling the priests at this time, look back at your heritage. Look back at this one who had stood up for what was right and who purged the priesthood and purged the Israelites of all those who had accepted the worship of Baal, all those who had accepted the gods of their foreign wives, and it had destroyed their worship. God is telling them, look back and recognize that that is what I expect. That is that standard that we uh, that he expected of those who were worshiping him. You know, we need to ask ourselves, are we faithful to God's word today? Just as he has required the Israelites to be faithful, just as he had required the priesthood uh, after Aaron and Levi and uh, down through those generations as he had required them to be faithful and to hold his worship sacred and reverent, do we make sure we do that? Let's take a look at 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, beginning in verse 9. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 9. Actually, it, it is 1 Peter in 2, 9, if I can get, there we go. And here, as Peter writes, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And as, as we look at this, we understand he's not talking about the Israel of old. He's not talking about those spiritual leaders in the old covenant. He's talking about us today. 
we are a chosen generation, just as the Israelites were. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, just as they were chosen and holy. We are his own special people. And that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he reminds us, once we're not a people, but now, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. There was a time when we were not God's chosen people. There was a time when we had not received mercy, but now we are his chosen people. We are that royal priesthood. So when we look at ourselves that way, we recognize that all of the obligations that came upon the priesthood in the Old Testament come upon us in the New Testament, that new covenant. We are to follow and keep pure that new covenant through our worship, through our teaching. You know, we got to ask ourselves uh, a couple questions you have there in your hand up. Do we preach and teach from God's holy word? And really, we're asking, do we preach and teach appropriately and only from God's holy word? Those things that are acceptable. Let's take a look at uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2, 2. If I can wait for my Bible here. Okay. Second Timothy 2, 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Make sure we choose faithful men and commit these things in God's holy word in this new covenant setting where we can ensure that the worship that we offer, those things that we teach are in accordance with God's covenant. Uh, make sure that we are doing those things that are acceptable to God. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter uh, 13. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 13 uh, and verse 15. And here the Hebrew writer records for us. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. We need to make sure that our praise is a spiritual uh, one to our heavenly father. Those things that we do, those things that we teach, they all should be in accordance with God's word. And we're going to be accountable the same way that Malachi was holding the uh, priest accountable in the Old Testament. Are we faithful to the new covenant the New Testament pattern. You know, there is a lot of confusion in many uh, people teaching the scriptures that 
they do not understand that all of those regulations and those requirements of the Old Testament have been fulfilled and set aside in our worship under the new covenant, under God's plan for us today. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 7 uh, and uh, beginning in verse 1. Romans 7, uh, beginning in the first verse, and we're going to go verses 1 through 6. And here Paul writes, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Now, they, they understood this regulation in the Old Testament. We understand this regulation today. Paul goes on, though. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And that last sentence there is giving us just a snippet of what the scriptures tell us about of the differences between the new covenant and the old covenant. The old covenant was full of regulations that you had to follow to the letter of the law. The new covenant is a spiritual regulation, a spiritual covenant. It's the ones that are written on our hearts. And God, through his word, tells us what the requirements are. And they are uh, centered around God's love for us because his son died for us on the cross. So as we see that, we recognize that the Old Testament has been put aside with the death of Christ, but we still must hold in reverence and awe the new covenant that was put in place by a much greater sacrifice, the sacrifice of God's Son, so that we understand we are still under God's law. As we uh, pick up in verse 7 now of uh, Malachi chapter 2, it says, you offer defiled food on my altar, but say, and what? Well, wait a minute. We're in the wrong chapter. I remember doing that last week. Okay, verse 7 of Malachi chapter 2. It says, For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. This is the level that God expects of those priests at that time. The priest was supposed to bring them knowledge from the law. He was supposed to uh, encourage people to seek him out regarding that law because he was, as we would say, the expert, the definitive answer from the law would come through the priest. And he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. 
these are the standards that he had given to them. And we have our standards today, but these are the standards he gave to them. But in verse 8, he says, but you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. You know, these were the expectations of our Holy Father, that they should, as priests, hold up that law in reverence. But they failed. They had departed that way as they had done at previous times, and we had seen that. They had wandered away. And now God was calling them in to account. You no longer are able to claim that position that you had. Uh, let's take a look at Romans uh, chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse uh, 17, because here uh, was just an example that carried over into the New Testament regarding how the Jews and their priests had defiled their worship. Uh, Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 17, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, and a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge, and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. This was their condemnation. Even though the old law had been done away with, and, and Paul is just using this as an example to them why they had lost their place, why they had lost their position. And it's an admonition for us today. Do not, as he said here, rest on the law. Don't, don't say, well, I've got it all together. We're doing things uh, that we ought to be doing and it's all good. Uh, and then not fulfill the requirements of the law. Some questions we can ask ourselves. And I think they're always very good to ask. Of, uh, of ourselves, and also certainly as teachers and leaders in the congregation, we need to put special scrutiny on ourselves so that we can know that we are meeting that standard before us. Is our goal to bring a greater understanding of the Word of God? Is that what we're looking for? Are we trying when we offer a class or an instruction or a sermon or a message or whatever it happens to be, are we trying to bring greater understanding of God's word? You know, the scriptures tell us it's time to go beyond those first fruits, those initial teachings, those elementary teachings. We can't continue to just teach that. We've got to go on to the meat of the word and get away from the milk of the word that's been given. We Do we seek to remind members of truths formally learned? We, I mean, we need to be reminded sometimes. That's why it's, it's just been a great opportunity um, these last years as Stephen has set um, 
goals in his preaching and has gone back and he started with those uh, fundamentals of faith and spent a year bringing us up to making sure we were refreshed with those fundamentals of faith. And then he went on to Christian maturity, making sure that we went beyond those fundamental truths and we're beginning to expand our knowledge and strengthen us so that we could reach out to others with a better understanding. And then this year with, with the spiritual 2020 vision, digging deep in the scriptures, uh, you know, starting with that great uh, series in Revelation at the beginning of the year and now going beyond that uh, to bring to our understanding how God is looking at us and what God requires. You know, do we uh, refute and correct false teachers? Let's take a look at James chapter 5 uh, quickly. James, chap James chapter 5, uh, and we're going to Look at verse 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he turns a sinner from the air of his waves, will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. You know, there are just so much... Uh, to excite us there. Now, it's often a difficult thing to go to a brother or a sister and say, you know, we need to talk about this. And so we all understand it really according to the scriptures. And once they come back to the scriptures and come back to a better understanding and service in the Lord, it's it's just a great thing for the one who has been turned and for the one who had gone to them and corrected them. You know, there's so much. Is growth in knowledge and growth in service to the Lord emphasized? Do we do that? Do we encourage people to dig deeper in understanding the scriptures? Do we encourage them to dig deeper in service to the Lord? We have so many different opportunities for Bible study uh, in uh, the Myrtle Beach Church, and we're, I'm just so excited about that, that, that we're offering uh, multiple classes uh, every time we meet. And then also in service, we encourage all those to be involved with different areas of service. And if you have a talent that we haven't utilized yet, uh, we encourage that and find a way to utilize that talent for the Lord. And we are certainly excited about all of that. As So as we look at this section in Malachi chapter 2, where Malachi is uh, being told by the Lord to admonish the priests. We should be looking inward and so that we understand that we need to be doing everything according to God's plan. So I appreciate your following along with me today. And uh, we will pick up next week in Malachi chapter 2. Uh, beginning in verse 10. So I appreciate you being here with us this morning.